This is Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture's Wednesday webinar, Farm Diversification, Ideas on Alternative Crops. Our presenter today is Andrew Ristvi, Extension Specialist with University of Maryland. Andrew has provided his email address, so since this is pre-recorded, all questions can be sent to him directly. To watch archived presentations or to see a list of upcoming Wednesday webinars, please visit our website. And a special thank you to our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Again, my name is Andrew Ristvi. I'm an Extension Specialist with Commercial Horticulture with the University of Maryland Extension. Uh, today's program uh, webinar is the Farm Diversification, Profitability with Specialty Fruits and Vegetables. This is actually a program overview uh, to a December 15th workshop that we did here at Y Research and Education Center on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Uh, it was a program designed to give people, uh, people with a little bit of uh, a land, a little bit or a lot of land, uh, some ideas on how to diversify their farm uh, for profitability. Uh, essentially looking at different uh, fruits and vegetables uh, and other alternative crops uh, that can be grown uh, for profit. Um, uh, we had a, a wonderful group of speakers and I took the liberty of taking snippets out of each of their uh, their talks and uh, developing this program overview. So why don't we get started. So uh, we had uh, Ginger Myers, Extension Specialist, uh, Agriculture and Marketing Specialist, uh, Kim Rush Lynch, again another agriculture marketing specialist uh, with the University of Maryland Extension. Both of them are excellent at, at helping you, uh, uh, helping you find uh, markets for your products. Uh, assistant professor, Department of Food and Safety and Biotechnology, Rohan Takekar. Uh, he uh, presented uh, interesting information about the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, Paul Geringer, uh, Extension Legal Specialist, uh, came uh, from the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. Stanton Gill, my colleague over at the Central Maryland Research and Education Center. He's an Extension Specialist for Horticulture and Floriculture, and also co-owner of McBride Gill, Falcon Ridge Farms in Carroll County. Yao and Fanchow, a friend uh, from the University of the District of Columbia, uh, agriculture and horticultural specialist, talked about ethnic specialty crops and the programs that he's doing over at the District of Columbia. Uh, Dave Myers, a uh, colleague, uh, an extension educator of horticulture and agriculture over at the Central Maryland Research and Education Center in Upper Marlboro. And then finally, uh, and last but certainly not least, Ginny Rosencrantz, uh, Extension Educator for Horticulture and Floriculture, uh, had a discussion on cut flowers. So why don't we get started? Uh, oh, yes, and of course me. Putting a face uh, to the voice, uh, I'm an Extension Specialist for Horticulture here at Y Research and Education Center. Uh, beautiful farm, uh, state research farm on the banks of the Y River. Uh, and uh, here I am doing uh, research trials on a variety of different specialty crops uh, along with uh, the people that we're going to be speaking or that will be uh, along with the, 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 the talks uh, that we've had uh, with, this, uh, with this program back in December 15th. Um, Hopefully, uh, you'll uh, get some ideas at the end of this program. Uh, so let's start. Uh, the uh, program started out with marketing. Both uh, Ginger Myers and Kim Rush Lynch did a, uh, a tag team uh, in, in helping you find markets uh, for your, for your uh, fruits and vegetables and ag products. Uh, basically gave you ideas on how to go about uh, uh, your marketing, uh, whether it was uh, with, uh, with social media uh, and, and and good ideas on, on how to go about uh, uh, marketing your farm and products. As I said before, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is a new FDA uh, uh, program, regulations based on, on making sure our food supply is safe. Recently, in the past few years, we've had a lot of outbreaks, uh, certainly in the news, uh, they, they're, they're quite common. On, on, on different uh, problems we've had with our food supply, uh, whether restaurants or even in grocery stores. Uh, this Food Safety Modernization Act is meant to create a pathway 
for uh, helping uh, greater uh, safety in, in, in our food products uh, and, uh, and may or may not affect a good portion of you. Uh, but it's a good it's a good idea to know uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this FDA regulatory uh, uh, act and uh, and also know a little more about uh, good agricultural practices. We have a, uh, a an agricultural a good agricultural practice program at the University of Maryland, and uh, it might be something that uh, if if this uh, webinar series hasn't included it might be something that uh, we might want to include uh, soon and uh, as I said before we have a running program that goes throughout the state to uh, to help farmers become certified in good agricultural practices uh, as I said before uh, Paul Geringer uh, talked about the legal resources that the University of Maryland offers farmers uh, with the agricultural law education initiative Again, there's a, uh, a website down there, which if you're curious about what that all is about, you can, uh, can, uh, can get into that website and, and check out the, that program. So let's talk a about the specialty crops, ideas for diversification. Um, you know, diversifying a farm is like, you know, it's diversifying a stock, a stock portfolio. It basically spreads your risk. Certainly, if you have underperforming stocks in one area, uh, other stocks might be doing better. In the same light, uh, if you've got uh, a variety of different uh, fruits and vegetables on your farm that you might be uh, selling for profit, having uh, maybe potentially a disease, uh, insect issues might take down one of your crops. You have other crops that you can still uh, turn back on for profit. Uh, and it essentially, you know, when you have more crops, um, it, it increases your, your potential profit in general. Uh, and also the good thing about having more crops is that uh, you have a, a, a larger window of sales uh, throughout the year. So I talk about alternative crops, and uh, a lot of people ask me, well, what's an alternative crop? Well, an uh, alternative crop is anything that's not a row crop. Uh, essentially, there's a higher value uh, per unit of land when you're growing uh, alternative or specialty crops, whether it's uh, flowers uh, or, or fruits and vegetables. And today I'll be discussing a variety of these crops, uh, potentially, with, with, with good potential for profit. Uh, and uh, and and discuss with you some of the things that uh, that, that that our presenters uh, gave us in the December 15th uh, program or the December uh, 2015 program. So we first started off with Stanton Gill, and as I said before, Stanton Gill is an extension specialist, uh, and he also owns uh, one of the uh, most diversified uh, farms that I know of in Maryland, uh, up in uh, up in Carroll County. Uh, and he brought uh, several suggestions on what potentially could be sold uh, as, as specialty crops, uh, high-value specialty crops in, uh, in, in the Maryland area. The first one he discussed was amelanchier, uh, or service berry. Uh, for a very long time, uh, these fruit have been used, uh, probably very important food for, for Native Americans. In Canada, they're pretty popular. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and, and, and there are a few varieties that, that, that Stanton has been working with uh, on his farm. Um, this, uh, this is a tree fruit uh, about the size of a very large blueberry. has a flavor of uh, blueberry and an apple kind of mixed together. Uh, excellent flavor. Uh, they ripen in late May to late June, depending on the coolness of the spring. Uh, you can see the wild species uh, blooming in the forests of Maryland uh, sometime in mid-April. And, um, uh, and, 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 then, and then the fruit uh, soon after develops. Stanton sells uh, a pint of these for $5. Um, he uh, suggests a, a North Line Saskatoon uh, for a bigger size and excellent flavor. Uh, one, there are a few problems that, that, that Amelank here has in the, uh, uh, in the environment. Uh, one in particular is, uh, since it's in the Rose family, it gets uh, gymnosporangium or, or rust, in particular uh, cedar apple rust or, or quince cedar rust. Uh, and uh, both of those can be problematic. Uh, basically, it just wipes out the fruit yield uh, and it can damage uh, the, the, the stems on the plant. Um, doesn't kill the tree, but takes out the harvest. Um, what you can do, though, is uh, use fungicides uh, at the beginning of the, of the growing season 
one or two sprays usually cures the problem and uh, you have no problem with the fruit later on. An additional problem uh, is probably birds. I think uh, Stanton maintains his trees around seven foot high so he can easily harvest, but he, I think he's also covering them. I do believe he's trying to grow these in high tunnels too. Um, so bird, uh, bird issues may be another problem with this fruit. Stanton went on to talk about hardy kiwi. Uh, hardy kiwi is native to Japan, Korea, northern China, and Russian Siberia. Uh, this is a very interesting fruit. It has a nice texture and sweet flavor. Uh, compared to the ones we typically see in the grocery store, they're rather, uh, these are rather small, uh, comparatively maybe a quarter the size. You can see that the skin on these is not hairy. Uh, it's fleshy, and uh, in fact, you eat the whole fruit itself. Um, Stanton has put in several varieties uh, in, at his farm in uh, Carroll County. Uh, and uh, he uh, had built a trellis, um, uh, as you can see here on, on the slide. The uh, trellis has uh, three or four wires going across. It's a T-shaped trellis. He's trained the vines to go up that trellis, and then he just picks the fruit from underneath. Um, Penn State uh, and Cornell University determined that more pollination occurs from wind than from traditional methods such as uh, pollinators. So uh, typically you put your male vines uh, placed in the, on the prevailing wind side so that uh, during the spring your uh, fruit can be uh, pollinated uh, through, through, wind, uh, through the wind. Uh, Stanton says when these are mature in about seven years they can yield up to uh, 50 pounds of fruit per vine. Uh, and um, uh, like I said, he's very happy with the varieties that he has uh, growing up at his farm. And uh, again, I can get you more information about any of this uh, later on uh, if you uh, I'll make sure you have my email. And so you can always uh, contact me for any questions you may have uh, about this program today. Stan then went on to red currants. Uh, it's an exceptional market for European clientele because uh, Eastern Europeans are very much used to this fruit. Uh, and uh, where he has his farm markets, he does have a Eastern European uh, clientele. Uh, that that uh, that often uh, uh, that buy from him. Um, he has, has a, a couple different suggestions for red currants. Or Jean Kirventets, an early season uh, uh, current, has excellent flavor and very important disease resistance. Uh, Rovada is a late season current uh, that he's suggesting we grow. Um, as far as black currants, he's uh, suggesting consort. Uh, it's one variety he's thinking that, uh, that uh, you should try. One thing about disease is that the white uh, currants are, have good flavor, um, but they're virus prone, and that can be very problematic. He kind of warns you to stay away from those uh, in particular. Uh, like his kiwi, Stanton has trained his, uh, his, his uh, currants to go on a trellis for easier picking. Um, as you can see here in this picture, um, uh, kind of a rabbit fence uh, was put up, uh, and uh, they're uh, they're growing on the uh, uh, this uh, this particular uh, trellis. Finally, uh, as far as fruit goes, uh, this is a very interesting one: um, melon or chichi fruit. Uh, Stanton says this one tastes like watermelon. He's gotten really good sales off of this. And uh, although uh, some people think it tastes closer to cantaloupe, this particular uh, berry ripens uh, late uh, in late October. So it actually gives you another interesting window uh, for, for farm market sales. Uh, Stanton also talked about not only growing crops, but actually processing them. Something that he suggested, uh, potentially anyway, something that they do in Japan is called apple wrapping. Uh, with m many of these larger fruit, uh, even uh, grapes and things, uh, you need sunlight to uh, start that ripening process or at least getting the appropriate color uh, on the fruit. In Japan, they uh, take apples and they wrap them, keep them from the sunlight so that while the apple is ripening, it doesn't turn color. So you have these very interestingly colored, uh, very pale uh, uh, apples, which are completely ripe, they're just not red. 
Some other very interesting things that they do in Japan is actually putting on appliques onto the apple. So during the ripening process, uh, certain par parts uh, under that underneath that applique, uh, these uh, stickers, uh, sunlight does not reach them, and you can actually create a stencil uh, shape on, on an apple. So during that ripening process, you put these uh, stickers on, uh, and then you have these, uh, these stencil-like uh, writings on the apples. Um, they act like high contrast negatives on these apples, these, uh, these stickers. Uh, some have sayings on them, like best wishes. If you uh, uh, like, for instance, I think Stanton had mentioned that um, they were being used in a in a in a a a marriage ceremony or a marriage dinner, and they were passed out as gifts. And basically, uh, they went into uh, had the names of the brides and and, and the groom and and best wishes on them. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Stan heard of one Japanese pop star who put his picture on these apples to give to his entourage for presents. Uh, so, so interesting things that you can do with uh, with the fruit in that light. We went on with Yao and Fan Chao, uh, ethnic specialty crops. Uh, he gave an overview of his program that he has at the District of uh, University of District of Columbia. Um, as we know, the United States is a melting pot of different cultures. Uh, the common ethnic groups we have are Hispanic, African, Asian, European, and each of these cultures has different food, uh, uh, cultural foods that we may be able to capitalize on uh, if you know what, uh, what particular uh, cultures are uh, in your location. For instance, according to the 2010 census, uh, 1.2 million foreign-born uh, persons are living in Washington, D.C. metro area. In particular, 162,000 African-born immigrants are in the in the metro area, and uh, and and these these uh, these 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 immigrants they're very much interested in in, in having their own uh, foods, their own cultural foods. He did a study uh, looking at uh, the demands of crops and what was available. So the most demanded crops he found were garden egg uh, and uh, hot peppers. Uh, kiddily and uh, jute leaf, uh, water leaf, all of these uh, he uh, uh, were, were suggested that uh, were in highest demand. They were also the least available, uh, the uh, hot peppers uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the jute leaf. All of these are potential uh, profit makers in certain areas, especially the Washington, D.C. area. The consumer preference is, of course, for fresh, um, uh, and uh, most of the time they're coming in um, either frozen. And so there is that market, that potential market, if you're willing to, uh, to go that direction with, uh, with certain foods. Some of these foods that, that he was referring to, I'll, I'll list out here. Uh, one in particular is called garden eggs. It's in the, the tomato family, solanum, athiopicum. Uh, it's also known as an African eggplant, uh, many different other associated names. Uh, even the leaf is eaten as a, as a, as a vegetable uh, and can be more nutritious than the fruit. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, he stated that the, the garden egg is one of the most important vegetable crops grown in, in West Africa and especially Ghana. So um, there is a, there's a potential uh, uh, for having these available and uh, for potential profits. Uh, Goboma, um, another uh, solanum, uh, is uh, also called African eggplant. Um, it's uh, grown in many West African countries and uh, probably occurs in most all of the coastal countries in Africa. Uh, and uh, again, uh, several of uh, these, uh, these, 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 these plants as cultivars can be found in South America uh, and the Caribbean. So that there, there again, there's these potentials of, of, of plants like this. Uh, Avuvo uh, is a uh, is in the amaranth family. It's a celosia, uh, and it grows widespread across South Africa and tropical Africa, West Indies, South uh, East and Southeast Asia. So there's a variety of potential cultures that may uh, be interested in utilizing this. Um, it's a cultivated, uh, nutritious, leafy green vegetable. Um, an interesting fruit is called kiddily. Uh, was one of the ones that were uh, in, in demand uh, in, in Yao's uh, uh, survey. 
Uh, it looks like a cross between an eggplant and a green tomato. Uh, Gilo is originally from Africa. It was brought to Brazil with a slave trade where it's grown. Uh, it's still grown in West Africa, and in some countries it's known as garden eggs. Um, I am, interestingly enough, growing some of uh, very similar vegetables here uh, that I, at Y Research in high tunnel trials. I'll talk about those later on. Sawa Sawa, or sour leaf, uh, uh, known uh, as that in Sierra Leone, West Africa. The hibiscus uh, is a shrub-like uh, plant that has many branches. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, used uh, as a leafy vegetable. The leaves consist of five slender lobes, which are edible as a green uh, leafy vegetable, either in salads or cooked uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 and can be used as greens or in combination with other vegetables uh, or with meat or fish. Traditionally, how it's uh, been uh, been in, been been utilized. Uh, it's also used uh, for tea in Asia and Africa. Hot pepper, uh, the Scotch bonnet in the habanero class of peppers. Of course, one of the hottest peppers in the world. Uh, these are in demand, uh, and uh, as you saw from that uh, survey, uh, one of the more important varieties of peppers that are that are wanted in the uh, in in the farm markets. Uh, so these are relatively simple to grow uh, and, uh, and, and can yield probably a pretty decent price, uh, something to uh, also consider for your farm markets. Um, jute leaf, again, another uh, highly valued alternative crop uh, for, for, uh, for African cultures. Um, it uh, can be grown here, uh, and uh, uh, it's a leading a leaf vegetable in the Ivory Coast, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, several other countries in Africa. Um, it's uh, also uh, cultivated in the Caribbean, uh, Brazil, uh, India, Bangladesh. So, so again, with with, with this particular uh, type of, of crop, um, it's uh, possible to capture a lot of different uh, ethnic cultures uh, and and interests uh, with, uh, with 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 in growing one of these. So Jama Jama or, or the African huckleberry, uh, this is very similar to a crop that I'm growing uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the high tunnel right now, in my high tunnels right now, and I can give you, again, more information about this one if you're interested. Um, these have a flavor of uh, kind of a melon, a sweet melon flavor. Interestingly enough, uh, it is also uh, being used as a leafy green, uh, as the same way as a mustard or collard greens. I'm not sure exactly how it's prepared, if it's fresh or if it has to be cooked. I'm thinking since it's in the solanum family, these probably need to be cooked. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, again, preparation is not my uh, area of specialty, something that Yao could certainly uh, speak to. Finally, uh, water leaf. Uh, it's another leafy vegetable that uh, that's, that's, that's has some demand uh, in the district uh, and the district markets. Uh, for all of these, uh, getting the seeds and potentially getting transportation, uh, getting these to market, uh, you may want to contact uh, Yao or you can contact me in particular, uh, and I can try to find uh, uh, ways of, of getting you uh, these uh, seeds uh, from Yao and uh, in his work group. So, go on to uh, another potential ethnic crop if you notice any of these, recognize any of these uh, logos. Uh, I'm sure that, that uh, you go to your grocery store and, and you can see uh, uh, several of the liquor stores and you can see uh, at least uh, uh, 30 or 40 different varieties of, of, of beer in, uh, in your stores. Um, I, can, I, can, I can attest to the fact that 30 years ago um, I would have never figured that I would see so many craft breweries uh, popping up and uh, craft beers in the stores available to us. This is uh, rather interesting. Uh, sirs, if you know that, um, that, uh, that, that, that beer is primarily made with four ingredients, water, uh, barley, or some other grain, yeast, and hops. Hops gives the flavoring characteristics of the beer. Because uh, in 2015, um, the number of breweries peaked since uh, the late 1800s in the United States, there is quite a demand on the uh, on, on the products uh, or, or on the, uh, the, the the materials that go into beer making, especially hops. Hops has been a uh, hops has been um, in fact uh, the, the price of hops has gone up quite a bit because of the use uh, because of all these microbreweries popping up and putting a strain on the supplies. 
Uh, therefore, a lot of uh, small growers are considering putting hops yards up on their land. Um, this uh, is an interesting proposition. Uh, we uh, had been considering uh, doing some research here at the University of Maryland, and uh, we are starting hops trials uh, at uh, three different research farms. Our Central Maryland Research and Education Center at Simrec um, had basically started up by David Myers, who I had introduced to you at the beginning of the program. He um, put one up in 2013 and has some interesting data to uh, share with you. Uh, at uh, the Western Maryland Research and Education Center in Keatesville, a, uh, a hops yard went up. Who we're testing 12 different varieties of, of hops. Here at Y Research, I put in a small hops yard. I'm testing four different varieties uh, and plan on putting in more. Uh, what we found um, is that uh, we're, what we're interested in in the University of Maryland hops trials is basically develop a needs assessment for, uh, for our hops growers and our brewers, find out what they need from us. We want to understand the cultural requirements of several of these varieties of hops that are being utilized in the brewery industry. Uh, what we want to know more is which uh, varieties will grow best in Maryland and where in Maryland uh, do they grow best. And on top of that, what are their cultural requirements? Uh, what are the things we need to be looking for? Um, uh, disease issues, pest issues. All of these we want to uh, kind of nail down and provide uh, potential uh, research opportunities for new questions that may come up uh, with our growers. Uh, we're going to be recording uh, harvest yields. We also want to know what kind of uh, what the quality of the hops that we would be growing, the alpha and beta acids uh, that 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 are so necessary for uh, for the for, for for making good beer. Uh, we want to develop Maryland-based extension programs for hops growers, and in doing so, um, uh, we'll have these uh, these programs uh, ready for us uh, and uh, and such. Um, I think that uh, that that uh, in one of the uh, the, the programs uh, or that we had over at Sim Simrec, uh, Upper Marlboro, the um, we we were growing about uh, 2,000. Or what Dave Myers was able to figure out from his small hops yard is he's averaging about uh, uh, between 800 and 2,000 pounds of fresh hops per acre, uh, so that there's that, there's that potential. One of the problems that we do have with hops, and if you are considering growing hops in your yard, is you really want to get a hold of the breweries that uh, in your local area because they're going to be your ultimate um, uh, uh, market for your hops. Uh, the one thing that we do know in uh, in hops harvesting is that uh, uh, that that has to be uh, either dried very quickly to a 12% uh, moisture content, or used immediately because within a day your hops quality can really break down. Um, and so what breweries are really interested in is dry pelletized hops. And um, uh, and I know that there is an association uh, in Virginia that uh, that has, has that has got a pelletizer and dryer system, um, but for the average grower uh, with just growing a small amount of hops, um, the best use for that, and if you can't dry and pelletize immediately, is to do session brews. So you want to uh, take uh, your hops immediately over to a brewery, and they can do a, a seasonal uh, a batch uh, uh, and, and they'll be using your hops. And there's a few breweries that already decided that they want to do that uh, in Maryland. Um, so that's the potential. So my suggestion with hops is to contact your, your breweries and find out if they'd be interested in, uh, in, in any fresh hops uh, 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 batches. Next, um, it's, uh, you, can't get a, you can't have a program uh, from me without me talking about Aronia. Aronia is a, a small fruit in the pome uh, in the pome family, uh, basically an apple or pear family. They um, uh, this particular fruit has a very high antioxidant content. Uh, the parent plant of of the cultivated variety right now is native to uh, Maryland uh, and a good portion of the east coast of the United States. Uh, the marketability of this crop is because of its antioxidant content. One of the problems that we are having right now with this crop is the fact that uh, not many people know about it. Uh, there are two associations in the United States uh, which are promoting the use of this uh, crop, uh, promoting the, um, uh, the, the, the purchase of this by marketing. 
basically by educating consumers. Um, this crop can be used um, uh, by uh, uh, freezing. Uh, you can throw them in your smoothies. You can bake with it. You can make uh, uh, syrups and jams and jellies. So there's a value-added potential. I've got a grower in Meridel who's making uh, wine with this uh, fruit. He uh, won third place in the great in the um, was it the Finger Lakes uh, International Wine Contest for fruit wine. So he's doing a relatively good job with it. Uh, our, our, our vineyard specialist and enologist Joe Fiola is uh, experimenting with different, uh, uh, different uh, recipes for Aronia wine. So there are some potential markets for Aronia right now. Um, and uh, right now I know the growers who are managing this uh, crop are either managing or either selling it uh, with uh, individually quick frozen IQF or actually making a value added product with it are really focused on uh, marketing uh, themselves uh, so that might be a uh, so if you're interested in this uh, particular crop it might be one of those things where you might want to uh, to, to look at your potential markets and develop a market plan um, in in general this uh, this particular crop is relatively easy to grow it's got a few uh, problems uh, it's got Japanese beetle uh, and which is a which can be problematic um, but it can be grown organically uh, and uh, several of our growers are certified organic, uh, and uh, and uh, and and very few disease problems. Uh, so it is a relatively easy crop to grow compared to many other fruit crops that we have uh, growing in Maryland. I am doing uh, ground cherry and, uh, and fruiting nightshade high tunnel trials. As I said before, uh, that these are some of the things that I'm working on. Uh, ground cherries uh, are a, a type of uh, basically that's like a husk cherry. I think you're all familiar with tomatillos uh, in the grocery store. This is a crop that's been popping up in grocery stores around Maryland. This, I've, I've, I've uh, noted that in Harris Teeter, uh, these, uh, these little ground cherries are being sold in little clam packs uh, for uh, about 10 or 12 for $4.00. So um, it is really a relatively high-priced uh, uh, product, a very highly valued uh, uh, fruit product. Um, uh, Phyphsalis peruviana is the species I think we're using in Peru. It's called a chuva. Uh, the uh, Cape gooseberry is another uh, common name for it, or goldenberry, which is what you're going to see in the United States quite often. Uh, in France, uh, they have uh, the name, which I really enjoy, a Morancage. Uh, and uh, uh, and believe me, these fruit have really interesting flavor. Uh, cross between a pineapple and a, and a, and, uh, and 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 a cherry or, or something like that. It, it is really interesting. A very high value crop. We are doing variety testing at Wise. I said before, I'm looking at uh, 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 Gigante and uh, Goldenberry. Those two uh, particular uh, varieties. Uh, and what we're really interested in also is to look at the phytochemical content, especially uh, some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the the phytochemicals like um, uh, like the uh, like, uh, like uh, what is it lycopene and, and things like that 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 uh, that are very healthy for you. Um, Additionally, I'm looking at uh, several, a couple different fruiting nightshades in the solanum. Um, I'm variety testing this one called Wonderberry, Solanum nigrum. Interestingly enough, it's not, uh, not, it doesn't look too different from the one that, that uh, Yao had, uh, had referred to earlier. Um, it's a rather small uh, fruit, tastes like a le uh, melon. And um, I'm, I'm harvesting these at about uh, a little over a pound per plant uh, each week. Um, I have noticed that these are rather fragile, and it's something that we might want to try to be real careful with. I think what we need to do is actually clip the whole, um, instead of trying to pick the fruit that way, uh, I want to clip the, the vine like a, like the, you see vine ripened tomatoes. They're on that. They're on the uh, stalk. I think this is uh, keeping them on the stalk is the best way to preserve this uh, fruit. Uh, additionally, um, there's another one called Solanum velosum or golden pearls. Um, also, a little flavorful little fruit, about the same size as the Wonderberry. Uh, additionally, these are typically kept on the stock because uh, these are fragile. Lastly, uh, can't uh, 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 can't get away with uh, talking about alternative crops without discussing uh, cut flowers. 
Um, cut flowers uh, can be uh, a very high value, especially at your uh, at your farm markets. I brought Ginny Rosencrantz to discuss uh, cut flowers uh, with you. Um, I don't have enough time to go through all the cut flowers that she discussed, um, but uh, she was able to supply me with several uh, uh, several uh, handouts. Uh, They're available for you. Cut flowers for high tunnels, woody cuts to consider, and, um, and adding cut flowers to increase your uh, profit. Basically a list of different cut flowers you may consider. So when you when you think when you think of cut flowers, uh, Ginny brought up uh, three different types of cut flowers uh, that you may consider. Uh, certainly with annuals, um, you've got a variety of different colors. They're relatively easy to grow. Uh, the thing about uh, annuals is that you can change them up each year depending on on the request that you may have. And what you have is you'll have uh, color all summer with the different annuals that you might be growing. This is an interesting one. This is another Celosia, and very interestingly enough, it, it looks a lot like one of the plants that, uh, that, that Yao had introduced earlier also. So when it comes to perennials, uh, you have specific bloom periods, uh, but you do have spectacular flowers with uh, perennials, and uh, something to consider uh, when, when it comes to uh, cut flowers. Um, and then finally, uh, woody plants. Uh, there are a variety of woody plants that, that are utilized in the industry, whether it's fresh or dry. Uh, you can really spread out uh, your, 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 your season when it comes to woody plants, even picking them, harvesting them in the uh, wintertime. And that kind of concludes the, uh, the, the overview of the December uh, program, uh, and uh, I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have on chat. As you can see right uh, there, um, I've got my email address. You're more than welcome to, um, uh, to email me, uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to get you in contact with any one of the uh, presenters that, that I uh, summarized here today. Thank you for watching our archived presentation of our Wednesday webinar. If you would like to see more archived Wednesday webinars, please visit our YouTube channel. Or to find a schedule of upcoming live webinars, visit our website.